In this video, we'll be going over some of the most sought after transmog weapons in WoW. These weapons can come from any source, but they must still be obtainable in the modern game. So unfortunately, we can't include items such as the Staff of Atiash or the Corrupted Ashbringer. First up on our list at number 20 is the Chromatic Sword. This sword is the only open world drop on this list and is desirable for its unique weapon glow, which has a vaguely rainbow theme. The Chromatic Sword was added to the game of Vanilla and its only source is from a rare elite basilisk, Scalebelly and Stranglethorn from which it has a drop rate of approximately 23%. This remained the case until the Cataclysm expansion when the Old World was revamped and Stranglethorn was split into two subzones, and the sword was removed entirely from the game since loot and quests were significantly altered and changed in the Old World. The sword remained unavailable until the Battle for Azeroth expansion when the Chromatic Sword was re-added to the game with zone scaling changing making it so it was able to be looted again since it could only drop from a specific level of the mod. Unfortunately, the drop rate for the sword is much lower somewhere around 1%. Blizzard have consistently been re-adding content lost to Cataclysm, with the most significant comebacks returning the Dragonflight expansion, with multiple old dungeons being re-added to the game. And at number 19, we have a famous Blade in Warcraft's history and lore, which was added in the Dragonflight expansion, Quel'zarum, a High Blade of the Lion, which was Anduin Lothar's sword. Anduin Lothar is a namesake of King Anduin, and was a close friend of Medivh and King Lang Rin, who was Varian's father and Anduin Rin's grandfather. This one-handed sword was added in the mega dungeon Dawn of the Infinite, and dropped from the Time Lost Battlefield encounter. Luckily, Blizzard was smart enough to make it drop from both Gromash Hellscream and Anduin Lothar in the Alliance and Horde versions of the encounter, respectively. This means that one of the swords that essentially founded the Alliance can also be obtained by Alliance players when they defeat Gromash instead of Anduin Lothar. Indeed, had Varian not come across Shalomain, today Anduin might be carrying this sword instead. So far, Anduin Lothar's other sword, the Royal Sword, has not made an appearance in the game as an actual weapon that is able to be wielded by players yet. Next up at number 18, we have another famous ancient Queldori sword. This time, we have the Queldalar. This sword is highly sought after for four main reasons, which are for the lore, for the appearance, for the achievement, and of course, for that fat loot. While quested in Ice Crown, players encounter Blood Queen Lanithel, who destroys the sword she once wielded where she fell near the Argent Tournament grounds at Queldalar Rest. To obtain Queldalar, players embark on an epic quest chain that starts with the item called the Battered Hilt. However, this item is only available at a small drop rate from mobs in the Halls of Reflection dungeon. Players restore Queldalar to its former glory for the respective faction they work for in Dalaran. For Alliance players, this involves a storyline with the Silver Covenant, and for Horde players, the factions involved with the Sun Reavers. Queldalar has its own storied history and it was originally forged by the ancient Keldorai with the help of the dragon aspects in Ages Pass. The return of Queldalar questline consists of 13 quests, and the major highlights include fighting the sword to subdue it when it comes to life, and purifying the blade in the Sunwell. We can't do this storyline justice with such a short description, but it certainly is a memorable one. Upon completion of this questline, players earn the achievement, the Sword in the Skull. What makes this questline unique is that upon completion, classes that can wield swords are given a choice of one of four different versions of this newly remade blade. Two of these swords are one-handed and two are two-handed. The two-handed versions are named Quel'dalar, Might of the Faithful, and the other is Quel'dalar, Ferocity of the Scorn. The two one-handed swords are named Quel'dalar, Kind of the Shadows, and Quel'dalar, Lens of the Mind. Classes that cannot wield swords, which in Wrath included Druids, Priests, and Shamans, are given a pity consolation choice of one of three different maces. This loot is notable in Wrath because it gave a weapon that was at a level equal to that of heroic versions of Ice Crown Citadel. Finally, Blood Elves get their own slightly different end quest at the end of the questline. After turning in the quest, Alliance players will see a pop-up of Arisa Windrunner celebrating the occasion, and Horde players will see Aethys Sunreaver yell. While somewhat annoying, luckily, since the dropped item is so rare, these pop-ups don't happen much. Which is a good thing, because there definitely isn't another annoyed NPC in Dalaran who likes to shout things about what task players have accomplished. Joking aside, the quest chain has had a serious influence on the game in many ways. To name a few, the entire idea of a somewhat customizing Legion artifact weapon with different appearances can probably be linked back to the different versions of Quel'dalar that sword builders can obtain. The dragon aspects have only empowered a few items and lore, and Quel'dalar being among them may have led to some of them coming to check out the heart of Azeroth and BFA and saying, yeah, that's cool and all, but it could use some more Azerite power. So with all this talk, why is Quodalar so far from this list at only number 18? We placed it here for three reasons. First, while the Battered Hilt drop is very small, it can be sold on the auction house and can sometimes be found in the Black Market auction house as well. As of the time of writing this video, in current WoW, the Hilt was going for around 140,000 gold. If a player has that much gold, then Quodalar is much easier to obtain and as such loses some of its uniqueness factor. Second, players are only allowed to choose one of the weapons and can only gain one weapon appearance at the end of the questline. Unlike more recent quests in Modern WoW, 
Not all the appearances are unlocked following the turn of the quest. Second, if your class can wield a sword but you want a mace, you're out of luck because you don't have access to the quest for the maces at all. Additionally, the quest line is not repeatable. With seven different variations in appearances, if a player actually wanted all seven items, they would need over 1 million gold to buy all seven hilts on the auction house. The million gold would also have to be split across seven characters and be planned out to make sure each class can wield the weapon type that the player wants. Third, and finally, and most importantly, the Sword of Quotalar has been said by Blizzard to be more of a novelty item. Quotalar is the sister blade of Quelsarar, the high blade that is more famous for being used with the Queldorai and not the Kaldorai, hence why Blood Elves get their own special quest at the end. While the Quelsarar is a famous blade and sought out after in its own right, it was removed from the game in Wrath when Anixia's Lair was revamped in patch 3.2, and so we unfortunately can't include it on this list. Partially to compensate for this loss, Blizzard added Quildalar to the game in the next patch in Wrath, patch 3.3, Fall the Lich King. It's a fun quest chain that was thrown in just because Blizz could and made the story feel more connected to the player. Another reason, I believe a minor one, is that non swordwooden classes that put in all the work to resolve the blade, and the blade says it doesn't accept the player as its wielder, which is a bit rude since you just saved the ungrateful sword and essentially brought it back to life. And at number 17, we have Zinrock, Destroyer of Worlds. This is an impressive two-handed sword, and there are actually two versions of it. We'll be focusing on this second iteration since the first one was removed when Zolgarub was updated in Cataclysm. The original Zinrock drops from Hakkar and Zolgarub. The Cataclysm one comes from the archaeology profession and is one of the few weapons that can be obtained from this profession. This newer version from Cataclysm has different colors compared to the classic one, and was meant as sort of a consolation prize if the player did not acquire the original prior to the revamp. This sword comes, of course, from Troll Archaeology and requires 150 Troll Archaeology fragments to complete, and of course just getting it randomly. As a fun fact, this sword actually has a brother. Its brother is Jinrock the Dark Apocalypse, which drops from Zul'jid and Zolomon. The next weapon on our list comes at number 16 and is Nazuro the Unbound Legacy. Added in Dragonflight expansion, the legendary quality weapon is unique for two reasons. First, it can only be obtained by the Evoker class, and second, it is the only fist weapon legendary in the game, at least at the time of writing this video. The legendary is crafted and requires some intensive and time-consuming resource gathering and involves numerous reagents. The item that starts the quest chain to obtain the weapon drops from Scale Commander Sarkath, the final boss in Aberus, the Shadow Crucible Raid, introduced in a while in patch 10.1. This dropped an item called the Crack Titan Gem, and starts the short quest chain to obtain the legendary. In addition to crafting ingredients, players must also recruit crafters from other professions to help them with certain parts, which makes it all the more headache-inducing. While the transmog is definitely cool, that is pretty much the only thing cool about it. The weapon does have a special ability, but this ability simply just buffs a nearby player and feels rather lackluster, having having to put in so much time and effort into making it. This weapon is also infamous for being the Ronin 2.0 announcement. When the evoker turns in the final quest and receives the legendary, the message pops up, a triumphant roar echoes from atop the seat of the aspects, as Nazuro the Unbound Legacy is formed. Every expansion needs a good meme or two, and this message certainly fulfills the criteria for Dragonflight. Next, at number 15, is a legendary mace, Valinar, a Hammer of the Ancient Kings. This one-handed mace is meant for healing specs and was added with the launch of Oldar in patch 3.1. Classes that can obtain and wield this weapon include druids, paladins, priests, and shamans. In Mists of Pandaria, the monk class was added to this list, and in Dragonflight, evokers were also added to the list. While primarily a healing weapon, this can give friendly targets an absorption shield, and this weapon was also a fairly good DPS weapon for its time, especially for Shadow Priests. To obtain this weapon, a player must collect 30 of an item called the Fragments of Alinar, which have a low chance to drop from every boss in Ulduar at around 20%. The chance does increase towards the end bosses in their hard mode difficulty, but as you can imagine, collecting 30 of these fragments, especially with group loot, was an enormous challenge. When players did finally collect all 30 fragments and combine them together, they were sent to a Titan console in Ulduar, which instructed them how to throw the pieces into Yogg-Saron and then defeat him. Not only must you defeat Yogg-Saron, but you can only cast the fragments into this big old mouth while he's casting the Deafening Roar ability, a hard mode only ability. When and if a player does finish the second quest, they will receive the hammer. When the hammer is equipped, the player will receive a feat of strength called Valinar Hammer of Kings. There are two main reasons this weapon is so sought after, aside from its appearance. The first is that it's a long and fairly grueling quest, requiring many weeks, if not months to years, to complete. This means few people have it, and is a sign of eliteness and prestige. Combine this with the fact that it all takes place in Old War, a longtime fan favorite raid, and you now have an instant connection to nostalgia. Secondly, this weapon is one of the few in the entire game to be a legendary weapon specifically for healing classes and support related rather than a simple DPS weapon. Because of this, Valinar Hammer of the Ancient Kings comes in at number 15 on this list. At number 14, we have another legendary for Dragonflight, and its name is Fear Lath, the Dream Render. 
This two-handed axe drops from Firak the Blazing, the final boss in Amidrasil, the Dream's Hope. This is a very cool looking weapon. Actually, it's a hot looking weapon. There is even a cinematic with the weapon being built for Farak. However, given that this weapon can cut between realities as shown by Farak when he enters the Emerald Dream, perhaps it's not the best idea to have a dumb warrior wielding it. While certainly not the only fire weapon on this list, it's coveted for not only its appearance, but also for being the weapon of perhaps Dragonflight's most favored antagonist from the expansion. The weapon, design-wise, is comparable to the previous 200 legendary Shadowmorn, sharing its shape but completely adjacent in aesthetic. Since it's a two-handed axe, only Death Knights, Paladins, and Warriors can obtain it and equip it. It is said by Blizzard that this weapon has a bad luck protection built into it, it will function similar to the Evoker Legendary from the 16th entry. Every week you kill Farak and Heroic and above, you do not receive the axe, and the following week it will increase the drop chance until you receive it. The Evoker Legendary also will only unlock for all players to obtain once the first mythic kill of Sarkareth was completed in your region, so it is expected this Legendary will behave the same way. Next up at lucky number 13, we have one of WoW's most enduring memes in the form of Thunder Fury, Blessblade of the Windseeker. This one-handed Legendary Sword starts a quest after two items have been collected from the Molten Core Raid. The left half of the Bind of the Windseeker drops from the boss Baron Geddon, and the right half drops from Gar. When one of these pieces is presented to the Twilight Hammer cultist High Lord Demetrian and Silithus, he gives the player an item called the Vessel Rebirth, which starts a chain where the player must gather a ton of special crafting ingredients and then finally kill one of the strongest air elementals, Prince Thunderin, who appears as a raid boss. And in fact, Thunderin is so powerful that after players defeat Alakir, the elemental Lord of Air during the Cataclysm expansion, Thunderin replaces him as the new elemental Lord of Air. Aside from trade chat spam, Thunder Fury is highly sought after for a few reasons. First, it represents a key part of the vanilla experience for most players, and Molten Core is the quintessential poster child for raiding in WoW. Second, the sword has a cool special ability, which is similar to a Shaman's Chain Lightning ability, but additionally it reduces nature resistance and slows attack speed of its first target. Finally, even if we did briefly mention in the questline, killing what is essentially a god and taking its weapon is pretty cool, especially after you spent all that time and energy to reforge it too. While it may be the oldest progenitor of the epic legendary questlines, it's still one of the first in the game and has a special place in many people's hearts. Thunder Fury provides a breath of fresh air, and awards a feat of strength achievement upon equipping it. Thunder Fury's status as a legendary meme has all been cemented as even Blizzard themselves have shown. When Blizz added the inflatable Thunder Fury toy in WoW's 11th anniversary, when equipped, the player gets the achievement, did someone say? The fact that it even is a meme in the first place shows how attached the player base is to this weapon. And while it may be more of a playful and fun weapon appearance, the weapon itself is still highly sought after and players have spent years for multi-core for the pieces in order to do the quest chain that rewards it. One final note before we move on, although druids, priests, and shamans cannot equip Thunder Fury because it's a sword, it's the only legendary weapon in the game that any player can acquire because the quest items can be looted by any class and the quests to obtain Thunder Fury are not class specific. Next up we have our first legendary bow on this list, Thoradol, the Star's Fury, which drops from Kil'jaeda in the Sunwell Plateau Raid. Unlike many other legendaries in WoW, Thoradol may be unique in that it has none or almost next to no lore surrounding it. Despite several lore speculations, the most likely real-world reason is that Blizz just wanted to give hunters a nice, shiny, two-handed legendary bow from the final boss of the Burning Crusade expansion. Thoradol's special ability was that it could magically produce ammo, meaning the hunter no longer had to carry around ammo or ammunition in their backs. However, when ammo and ammo bags were removed from the game entirely in the Cataclysm expansion, the bow really lost its unique ability. This legendary bow is closely linked to the Sunwell and even Blood Elves do not fully understand why or how it exists. As of the Dragonflight expansion, Evokers, Rogues, Hunters, and Warriors can all obtain and equip the bow, which has a drop rate of around 7%. The bow was the only legendary bow in the game for a long time, and its mysterious origin shrouded in mystery, which makes it a highly sought-after weapon. Finally, obtaining and equipping the bow awards the Thoradol the Star's Fury Feat of Strength achievement. And in 11th place, we have a set of two rogue-only legendary daggers, which make up the Fangs of the Father set. The main hand dagger is named Golan, Twilight of the Aspects, and the offhand dagger is called Tyriosh, Nightmare of Ages. Not only did this set grant extra agility and combo points, but it also had a special use ability that acted as a slow fall. These two daggers were added in Cataclysm and required quite a bit of time spent within the Dragon Soul raid. In fact, it's within the Dragon Soul raid that players must talk to Lord Dravastras to begin the quest chain to unlock the dagger. One of the things that makes these two daggers impressive, aside from their appearance, is the quest line to obtain them. Rogues work with the newly hatched Prince Rathion, who just hatched from an egg in the Badlands. This quest chain has 13 quests in total, and players slowly build each dagger up in three stages. Golan starts out as a dagger named Fear, then becomes the Sleeper, and finally turns into Golan. 
For Tyriosh, the dagger starts out as vengeance before becoming the dreamer and then achieving its final form. The epic conclusion of this quest line has players defeating Deathwing in the Dragon's Soul Raid and then bringing a piece of his jaw to Rathion. When the quest is turned in, a cutscene plays which shows Rathion's true intentions of why he was at Ravenhold Manor. I don't want to spoil it because it actually is kind of interesting the first time you see it. After the cutscene is over, Rathion will then forge the daggers for the rogue. Upon equipping the daggers, rogues will get the Fangs of the Father Feet of Strength achievement. These two daggers are also unique for several gameplay reasons as well. The Fang of the Fathers were, up to this point of the game, the only legendary weapon exclusively available to one class. They also gave rogue players more playable content and the questline gave some heavy lore information on the origins of Rathion. While the devs and writers probably didn't think too much of Rathion at the time of the writing and making of the questline for Cataclysm, Rathion would later go on to become a much larger part of the story in Mr. Pandaria expansion, and even later on became a main character in the Battle for Azeroth and Dragonflight expansions. And at number 10, we have our first non-legendary weapon in a while, Fandral's Flame Scythe, which is quite a unique weapon that drops from Fandral's Stankhelm in the Firelands Raid from Cataclysm. While more of a fiery staff than an actual scythe, Fandral's Flame Scythe is highly sought after by Druids because of the weapon's closeness with the Druids of the Flames. Fandral's Flame Scythe possesses a unique ability that allows a Druid to turn into a fiery flame cat while in cat form, as long as the Druid currently has a staff equipped. This made it essentially give a Druid's Feral form a new fiery skin that many Druid players wish to obtain. This appearance for the cat proved so popular that Blizzard added in the Burning Seed and Mop, which were a consumable item that could be looted. When used, this item gave the cat form appearance for one hour. Additionally, in Mr. Pandaria, Blizzard added a toy which did the same effect, called Fandral Seed Pouch. Finally, in Shadowlands, Blizzard allowed the form to be unlocked permanently in the barbershop once the staff's appearance had been collected on the player's account. While the staff itself is gorgeous, the mere fact that Blizzard had to add three different changes after it was first added to the game to keep up with the player's demand shows how special and unique the staff was. In fact, we even covered this a bit in more detail in our history in the Druid's Cat form video. All in all, Fandral's Flame Scythe truly is fire and well-deserving of a spawn this list at number 10. Now we move on to number 9, which is another weapon from the Firelands Raid. Dragon Wrath Terragos' Rest is a legendary staff that can be only be obtained by Druids, Evokers, Mages, Priests, Shamans, and Warlocks. To earn this staff, players must complete a quest chain with 15 quests, which involve the Bronze and Blue Dragonflight. After gathering a branch of Nordrasil and farming several weeks for mats in Firelands, players can finally complete the final quest, called the Stuff of Legends. Players may be familiar with this quest because the scenario actually unfolds in either Stormwind or Orgrimmar, where the Blue Dragon actually shows up to empower the staff. Aside from its impressive appearance, the staff boasts two unique abilities. First, it can replicate the player's spells, straight up at least doubling their damage sometimes whenever it procs. Second, when used, it can transform the player into Tergos's Visage, which allows them to fly. The quest line to obtain the staff isn't too complex, but it does have some interesting lore including politicking amongst the Blue Dragonflight and how Deathwing has infiltrated some of the other Dragonflights. Caligos also appears in the questline, though this is before he becomes an Aspect. It wasn't until Dragonflight when Blizzard added in the mount, called a Lingering Echo of Terragosa, which finally meant that players no longer had to have the staff equipped be able to transform. With the Blue Dragon Cemetery now accessible again, Caligos and the Adventurer finally lay Terragosa's spirit to rest. This item is one of the few items in the game that turns the player themselves into a mount. A similar item is the Vial of Sands from Mechanicalism Alchemy, which also turns the player into a dragon and allows for others to ride them. When the player finally equips Dragon Rat Terragos' Wrath, they earn the Feet of Strength achievement of the same name. Up next, we have the Scythe of the Unmaker. This polearm is a cosmic-only item that draws from Argus the Unmaker and Antorus the Burning Throne. Since it's a polearm, it can only drop for Death Knights, Druids, Evokers, Hunters, Monks, Paladins, and Warriors. While only a cosmetic item, it has a very cool appearance, and who doesn't want to wield the weapon of the Titan of Death? There is a blue-tinted version of this item that drops in any difficulty the Raid and Legion, but in Mythic, a red-tinted version can also drop. This weapon is unique in another way in the fact that it drops separately from Argus's other loot. It instead will automatically appear in the player's inventory, so be sure you have a backspace if you want to farm this scythe. Presumably, this scythe was made to be cosmetic only because players already had their own weapons in the form of artifacts. But then again, perhaps the devs considered making it a real weapon, but decided against it because, after all, do you really want a scythe of destruction beyond mortal comprehension being wielded by a bloodthirsty player with no morals? The red tint version of this cosmetic weapon that drops in the mythic only Argus can presumably be tied to the mythic only phase of the Argus fight, where Argus and his weapon get a lot more red tinted. Killing a titan itself is a pretty big deal, but getting this weapon is pretty sweet as well, especially when it's as cool as the scythe of the Unmaker. Luckily, after Argus dies, his big red soul doesn't cause any more damage and led to disastrous after effects. Next up at number 7, we're back for some more Fire Lord antics, this time with the legendary two-handed mace, Sulphurus the Hand of Ragnaros. This is the second legendary weapon from the Molten Core Raid. 
with the other being Thunder Fairy Blessblade of the Windseeker. Since it's a two-handed mace, only Death Knights, Druids, Evokers, Paladins, Shamans, and Warriors can wield it. Unlike most other legendary weapons in the game, this weapon actually has to be crafted with a blacksmith with a max skill. Sulphurus is created by combining the Eye of Sulphurus and the Sulphuron Hammer. The Eye of Sulphurus has about a 3% drop chance from Ragnaros and Molten Core. The hammer can only be crafted by a blacksmith after they talk to NBC in Blackrock Depths and gather a ton of reagents that can only be obtained from within and around Molten Core Raid. Added in patch 10.1.7, crafting Sulphuron Hammer will award the achievement destined to be legendary to the blacksmith. Once the mace has been created and has been equipped by the player, it awards the feat of strength achievement Sulphurus Hand of Ragnaros. This weapon is notable for three reasons, aside from its appearance and lore. First, it is the only legendary to be completely crafted by the player in the game. Second, since the Sulphuron Hammer is bind on equip, to create and then wield the mace, the player must be a blacksmith and must have a 300 blacksmithing skill. Finally, Sulphurus is Ragnaros' personal weapon, and this itself brings up two points. First of these is that the other legendary weapon from Molten Core, Thunder Fury Blessed by the Windseeker, is the weapon of an elemental prince, who eventually becomes an elemental lord. So if a player has both Sulphurus, Hand of Ragnaros, and Thunder Fury, Blessed Buddy the Windseeker, they have two weapons that once belonged to former Elemental Lords, and the former weapon of a current Elemental Lord. Finally, in the Firelands, Ragnaros drops a similar weapon, this time called Sulphurus the Extinguished Hand, which suggests that Ragnaros' real weapon was never taken. This is confirmed by the RPG, which says that the real Sulphurus was too big for any mortal to wield. But since the RPG is no longer canon, it's debatable as to whether the player has a replica, or Ragnaros had to make do with another similar weapon to name Sulphurus after the player stole his original the Molten Core. Ragnaros' huge mace does stay behind the Molten Core after he's defeated, but it also despawns after the corpse despawns. And speaking of weapons for vanilla, at number 6 we have Ashkandi, Great Sword of the Brotherhood. This epic two-handed sword drops from Nefarian and Blackwing Lair. What makes this sword unique is that its flavor tag says the initials AL are etched on the hilt. Most seem to think that these initials stand for Andu and Lothar, but there has been no confirmation from Blizzard. To support this claim, Anduin Lothar fell in battle in the Burning Steps, and from his memorial side, one can even see Blackrock Mountain. This sword has received two other nods in subsequent raids. First, in the Blackwing Descent Raid in Cataclysm, Nefarian dropped a sword named Reclaimed Ashkandi Brotherhood of Ashkandur, which suggests that it was indeed a trophy that Nefarian originally took and somehow managed to reclaim after he was revived by the Twilight Hammer. Another sword with a similar name is called Ashkandur Fall of the Brotherhood, which drops from the Echo of Notharion in the raid Aberus, the Shadow Crucible, which was added in Dragonflight. Finally, also added in Dragonflight and previously mentioned in this list, Quel Zaram, Highblade of the Lion, is an actual sword that was wielded by Anduin Lothar, However, this Quel Zaram cannot hold up to Ashkandi for several reasons, which is why it was put so low on this list earlier. First, Ashkandi has been around since vanilla, and many people have spent a lot of time farming for it. Secondly, Ashkandi is a two-handed sword, whereas Quel Zaram is a one-handed sword. Finally, while consuming timey wimey bronze dragon time shenanigans, Quel Zaram is certainly not the blade from our own timeline, but from some other one, which significantly diminishes its value. Next up at number 5, we have the second legendary weapon only available to one class. Added to the Shadowlands expansion, Rare Shalari, Death's Whisper, is a bow that drops from Sylvana's Windrunner in the Sanctum of Domination raid. It can only be obtained by the Hunter class, and when equipped, it awards the feat of strength achievement, Rare Shalar's Death's Whisper. The bow has a special ability called Wailing Arrow, which does AoE shadow damage and also silences targets for 5 seconds. This ability was later added as an option for Marksman Hunters with the Talent Tree revamp in Dragonflight. Despite all of Shadowlands' shortcomings, a legendary bow from a fan favorite Sylvanas herself certainly was one of the highlights of the expansion. This weapon is the Banshee's Queen's very own, and luckily she is still in the Maw or else she would probably be coming after the Hunter who possesses it. Next up at number 4, we have the legendary two-handed axe from the Ice Crown Citadel named Shadowmourne. This weapon can only be acquired by Death Knights, Paladins, and Warriors, and requires an intensive questline involving 10 quests throughout multiple weeks in Ice Crown Citadel. Shadowmourn is made of the Warhammer wielded by Arthas Menethil during his life as a paladin. Players are instructed by High Lord Darren Morgreen himself to go to the Frostmourne Cavern to retrieve it and reforge Arthas' old weapon, Lights of Vengeance, into Shadowmourn. However, the Lich King has already anticipated this move and has his own plans. The first iteration of this axe is called Shadow's Edge, before it becomes empowered to become Shadowmourn. We can't give the questline story justice with such a short amount of time that we have, but it certainly is a long and fairly grueling one requiring special mechanics with specific bosses in Ice Crown Citadel for multiple weeks. The final quest requires the player to kill the Lich King with his former weapon in an iconic and sad twist of fate. After finally obtaining the Legendary Axe, equipping it will grant the player the feat of strength achievement, Shadowmourne. This questline to obtain Shadowmourne is somewhat infamous and requires a lot of time, patience, and friends. 
As you can probably imagine, a legendary weapon from one of the most legendary raids in all of World of Warcraft is certainly going to have a place on this list. And at number 3 on this list, we have Gorhal, Might of the Warchief. This two-handed axe also drops from the time-lost battlefield in the Dawn of the Infinite Dungeon added in Dragonflight. The same encounter that Quell's Aram, High Blood of the Lion, also drops from. Aside from being the weapon of the only Horde Warchief who did nothing wrong, this axe goes perfect along with the Tusk of Manoroth that so many players spent so long farming in the Siege of Orgrimmar. Garrosh is a fan favorite character, and the fact that Blizzard is still adding content around him even almost a decade after they almost killed him off in game in itself is impressive. Whether or not if it's fan service, this version of Gorhal is highly sought after. And not just because so many Magar or Gorders pretend to be Garrosh. Similarly to Quell's Aram, High Blood of the Lion, both factions can receive the axe, so even Alliance players can earn the Gorhal as well. While Prince Melgazar and Karazhan does drop an axe named Gorhal as well, this is directly contradicted in lore, which says Thrall held onto Gorhal until he gave it to Garrosh personally. The new Gorhal also uses the same model as the one that can be seen in Warlord of Draenor. Finally, there's a cool easter egg where orc characters that have the weapon equipped and choose the Warsong banner during the orc heritage questline may summon the Ghost of Gromash Hellscream, who will salute them. The weapon of one of WoW's most iconic characters being made obtainable by the players themselves is a pretty big deal. And to compensate, it's probably here that Blizzard decided to give Alliance players something and also added Quelzaram as an afterthought almost. Overall, the weapon of Garrosh Hellscream, former Warchief of the Horde, finally being obtainable made a lot of players happy. And it's among one of the most interesting loot items that can drop in the Dawn of the Infinite Dungeon, which is why it's at number 3 on this list. And at number 2, we have Tashalak. This is another cosmetic weapon from the Titan from the Antorus the Burning Throne Ring. Tashalak is a two-handed sword of the Titan Agrimar, and has seen much use, including when Agamar dueled with Sargeras himself. Not only is the appearance extremely cool looking, it's also an extremely low rate of dropping, speculated at around 0.1%. Tashalog drops from Agamar himself, who serves as the penultimate boss before Argus. To say that this appearance is highly sought after is a vast understatement. While the Scythe of the Unmaker in the number 8 spot was already cool, Tashalog is the sword of essentially a god. Like the Scythe of the Unmaker, Players do not really receive the sword, but rather a cosmetic item of it. It is doubtful the mortal could even wield Tashalak, since it's probably beyond comprehension of the player's physical limits. The lore behind this blade is important and history, and it serves as a symbol of the titan's might, which makes it all the more enticing for the player to have. Tashalak is a fire-infused weapon, which is quite a common trope in the weapons that we've seen so far. However, an epic, fiery weapon wielded by the Lieutenant of Sargeras is very hard to beat, and it's no wonder it's such a hot item. And finally, at number one, we have the War Glaives of Azanoth. These are a set of two blades, one main hand and one offhand that together make up the twin blades of Azanoth. Both of these blades are the War Glaives of Ilden Stormrage, and drop from him in the Black Temple, where he serves as the final boss. In game, both of these items are actually one handed swords, as it wasn't until Legion when the War Glaive weapon type was added to the game alongside the Demon Hunter class. Since they're classified as swords, only Death Knights, Demon Hunters, Monks, Rogues, and Warriors can have the blades drop for them and be able to equip them. These items are so integral to Illidan's story and Demon Hunters that they managed to get a new type of weapon added to the game in the Legion expansion. Even if it was 9 years later and Illidan's Warglaives only served as an inspiration, for a pair of legendary weapons to result in a new type of weapon being added is pretty impressive. Needless to say, both of these blades are very cool looking and their drop rate is horrendously low and players spent years farming for them. If that wasn't bad enough, they do not drop together, meaning you can continuously get one of the blades, but not the other. The player can get the Feet of Strength achievement War Glaives of Azanoth, but only after equipping both blades. This means that players essentially have to farm the same boss twice to get two legendaries instead of one. Wildhead lists the chance of each of the glaives to drop from Illidan at 5%, meaning if you were incredibly lucky and ran Black Temple only once, you would have a 0.25% chance to get both blades on the first run. Combine this on top of the Black Temple already being a pretty long linear raid, and you can see why trying to obtain both of the main hand and offhand war glaives is a massive pain in the Azanoth. If the player has gotten the Feet of Strength Achievement War Glaze of Azanoth and they defeat Illidan in the Burning Crusade Time Walking as a Demon Hunter, they get the achievement, I'll hold these for you until you get out. This achievement also awards the Arsenal, the War Glaze of Azanoth transmog set only available for Demon Hunters, since the War Glaives are not swords, but War Glaives and need to have a different transmog. Blizzard is quite aware of how many people farm Black Temple to get the War Glaives, and there are even two items in the game that take players directly back to the Black Temple to make it easier for farming. The first of these is a neck item obtained for doing a series of quests and is called the Blessed Medallion of Karabor. It is a 50 minute cooldown and teleports the player to the front entrance of the Black Temple. The second item to get to Black Temple is by Kupri, the timewalking vendor in Chatrat City during the TBC timewalking. Kupri sells the Fractured Necrolite Skull for 750 time warp badges. Added in patch 7.2.5, 
This toy is pretty unique and nifty. When used, it kills a nearby critter and opens a mini dark portal to the Black Temple. Illidan has long been a fan favorite character, and his redemption arc in Legion was generally well received. But when he also drops one of, if not the most sought after pair of weapons in the game, of course, the Warg Lives as Noth are going to be number one on this list. Well, that about does it for this video. And before it ends, here are a few things that I want to mention briefly. First, this video was originally going to be 10 transmog weapons that were all legendaries, but that was pretty boring, so it was bumped up to 20 instead. While legendary almost always looks and feels refreshing, too much of the same thing would make for a very dull video. Second, huge thanks to Wowhead's transmog popularity tool, which was a huge part in how these weapon transmogs were ranked. Finally, it wasn't until patch 8.3 that the legendary transmogs were even possible. So, big ups to Blizzard for finally making that happen. It gives some of the old legendaries more time to shine again. Finally, we didn't include any of the Legion artifact weapons on here, because although some of them are very cool and unique, they are easily obtainable and it doesn't take much work if a player wants to get the base version of the artifact weapons. 